Great to see all of you on a Sunday morning. Trust you all well. We're preaching through a series about the purposes of God, and we're looking at what it, what it looks like for us to serve the purposes of God. We're looking at the life of Jesus. We're looking at the life of other men that have served Him, served His purposes. And this morning I want us to, to start in Matthew chapter 16. Before I start to read, I want to ask you a question this morning. If I had to ask you to examine your faith, how do you know this morning that you are in the faith? How do you know that your faith is real, that your faith is vibrant, that you lay a hold of the real thing? What a rhetorical question. It's a question I'd love for you to answer if you're happy. How do you know that your faith is alive? How do you know that your faith is real? Anyone? The Holy Spirit? Say again? Prayers are answered. Awesome. Let's try the middle section. When you have peace, awesome. You can hear the voice of God. The joy of the Lord. Awesome. See, you guys are waking up slowly but surely. Try once one or two more. How do you know that you're in the faith? You've got hope. There's fruit. Let's go. You think differently. You see the unseen. There was another one. People see you differently. Wonderful. Keep your answers in mind as we look at the text. All right. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. It says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed. And on the third day, be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. And then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Jesus says in verse 24, if you want to come after me, where do we want to follow him? Jesus is saying, if you want to come after me, if you want to follow and, and serve the purposes of God, you're going to have to follow it and do it the way that I'm doing it. In the context of Matthew 16, we, says, we see that he, he dies for sin. Peter says, no, you cannot go and die for sin. We cannot afford to lose you. And Jesus rebukes him. But then what comes next is not the dying to sin. What comes next in this passage, if we want to follow Jesus, is we have to learn how to die Self. See, the cross deals with sin, but it also deals with self. And if we're going to serve the purpose of God the same way that Jesus has, we have to learn how to follow Him, reckon ourselves dead to sin, and then we have to learn to reckon ourselves dead to self. Happiness? Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Here's your answer to your question. 
How do you know that you're in the faith? I love the sound of the Bible's turning. iPhones are dead quiet, but the Bibles, they make a noise. Two Corinthians chapter 13. Paul is dealing with a church that is very carnal. The stuff that's happening in this church, you'd be shocked to see. There are sons sleeping around with their mother-in-laws. Hey, that's the church that you and I are part of. There are believers that takes one another to court because of wrongdoings instead of just saying, you know what, my brother, bless you. And so Paul is dealing with this church that is so carnal. It's a carnal um, community of faith. There's no spirituality around them. Interesting though, they have the speaking of tongues, the manifestation of gifts, but they're carnal believers. And so Paul writes this. When they question his authority to lead them, he says this in 2 Corinthians 13 verse 3, Since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me, he is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For to be sure, he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power, we will live with him to serve you. Here's your answer. Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. My Father, this morning, we want to learn from the life of Jesus. We want to look at his example we want to learn and we want to apply. We don't just want to be hearers of the word. We want to be doers of the word this morning. Father, this morning I need help. Because I want to speak about the mysteries of God. Which means to the natural, fleshly mind, some of these concepts might get lost. I welcome you this morning, Holy Spirit, and I ask you to to just anoint me afresh to serve your people well. Just to serve your people well, Lord. I pray that the words will not just be words that will be empty, but that these words will be impactful, that our lives will be challenged, our souls will be transformed. We bless and honor you this morning, Lord. Amen. So if you had to write the test, there was one question, are you in the faith? Would you have said that? How do you know that your faith is real? Would you have passed the test? It's a, it's a hundred or not, the test, because <laughs> there's only one answer. It says, how do you know that your faith is real? There's only one test. You know this, that Christ lives inside of you. Does that produce peace? Oh yeah, my goodness, it does. Does that produce joy? Oh my goodness, it does. Does that give you perspective to see spiritual realities? Yes, my goodness, it does. But do not look at the fruit if you don't know what the root is. Do you know this morning, is your faith of such that you know this morning as I'm sitting in this church, oh my goodness, my faith is real because the life of Christ is living and breathing and healthy inside of my spirit. You see, we can do a lot of church. We can ask for a lot of the spirit to fall, and we can ask all the manifestations of the spirit. And you know me, I love the power of God. But it's no good we pursue those things and fail the test of faith. That you don't know that Christ lives inside of you. That the very life you're living this morning, the very life that's inspiring you, that's breathing in you, that's moving you, that's energizing you, that's giving you insight and instruction and wisdom, it's not yours, it's His inside of you. You okay? 
So let's examine this morning. Whose life are you living? Are you living your own, your selfish life? Or are you allowing Jesus, are you allowing Christ to live through you, to live in you? Are you okay? Hy man het heel achter, hy is doodstil. Hy het baie nekies aangetrek vir kerk, maar ek wil graag met julle praat vir oogend. Julle kan huis toe gaan met baie joy. Let's turn back to Matthew chapter 16, because in Matthew chapter 16 we find the answer. For examining ourselves this morning and we finding, oh my goodness, I wasn't sure that that was the answer I would have given then you have to pay attention this morning. 2 Corinthians 13 asks the question, Matthew chapter 16 gives you the answer and the how. How do you get it right to have Christ inside of you? It starts off in Matthew 16. Give me a moment. Verse 24, Jesus says, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Verse 25 says, For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my life, for Christ's life, for Jesus' life, will find it. If you're going to examine your faith this morning, if you're going to examine whose life you're living, you have to start off by examining yourself. Now, it's interesting, if you look at the original word of, for self in the original languages, it simply just means this. When he talks about self, he talks about your will. Whose will are you serving? Are you doing what you want, when you want, how you want it? Or are you giving yourself to do what Jesus would want you to do? It's a very simple question this morning. Examine your will. Whose will are you serving? Your own? When it suits you? How it suits you? Or have you learned to serve His will? Jesus had to learn that for Himself. It says in the Garden of Gethsemane, He's, he's, he's sweating blood. He's under huge pressure. He says, Father, I wish this cup could pass me by, but not my will, but your will be done. The first mark of a carnal Christian is that you're busy serving your will. You profess Jesus. You've got all the right answers. You can give all the right conclusions and you read the Bible, you come to church, you do all the things, but deep down, if you had to examine yourself, you're busy doing what you want, not what Jesus wants. Examine yourself this morning. Examine yourself. I've got no, no intention to, to rub, but I've got every intention to make sure that at the base we are spiritual Christians, not carnal Christians. You see, carnal Christians is all about the trimmings, all about the outside, all about how things look on the outside. But the reality of the life that sustains them, they got no clue about. How I spend my money, I decide. What I spend my time on, I decide. When I go on holiday, I decide. There's some markers. Whose will are you serving? Your own or His? Examine yourself this morning. Whose purposes are you pursuing? His or yours? If you're in the faith, if you examine yourself and you find yourself in the faith, it's when you prefer His will. It doesn't matter what it costs. I want to say something about me, but it's not about me. It's just the only example I could find. Are you all right? It wasn't particularly my life's passionate pursuit to be a preacher. It was not like when I grew up, I thought, oh my goodness, I can't wait to stand in front of people and actually just tell them. It wasn't my pursuit. When I got selected at high school level into the head boy position, I gave my speeches to the deputy head. I did not want to speak. I had this idea of 
of making lots of money and find a couple of farms and just enjoy them every weekend on another farm in South Africa. It's not a small dream, but that's what I was dreaming. But when I encountered the reality of Jesus and His love and mercy, I had to make a choice. Am I going to serve my will or am I going to bow my knee to say, Lord, whatever you want. I don't know how this thing is going to work, but if that is what you want, then I'll give myself to it. Please just help me. You're right. I wasn't particularly excited about selling my sponsored cars. I wasn't excited about that. I had this idea for my life. I want to go do that. I grew up poor. I didn't want to go into ministry to battle poverty again. But you have to get to the point where you examine yourself. Whose will are you pursuing? Whose will are you pursuing? Is it what you want? Is it what you want for your kids, or is it what Jesus wants for your children? Is it what you want for your life, or is it what He wants for your life? I think you're catching my drift. Can I just be honest with you? There's some days when serving His will is very difficult. Is there anyone that can witness? More often than not, it's easier just to do my will my way. But I have to examine my faith. Am I in the faith where my will is surrendered? Where my will is surrendered? Lord, honestly, I would have been out of this thing a long time ago. The way the church offends you, the way the church bites at you, the way the church can hurt you, anyone? I would have been out a long time ago if it was about my will. Are we all right? You folks are awfully quiet. Jesus says, listen, decide. I know that because you believe in me, you know that you've died to sin. It's an amazing truth. It's an amazing reality. But do you know that you also need to die to self? How do you do it? Deny your will. Deny your will. Very often as a believer, it feels like you're a prisoner for the Lord. You don't have a say. You just do what he says. Anyone that's been in prison? One, two, three. I'm not talking spiritual. I'm talking the real tricky. (laughs) When you're in a physical prison, they tell you when you eat. They tell you how much you eat. They give you what you want. They tell you when you go to loo and you are not comfortable. Paul says, as a prisoner for the Lord. I don't have a say anymore. You don't have a say anymore. He's got to say. It's his will. It's his desires. When he wants it, he gets it. Verse 26 of Matthew 16 says, What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world? It forfeits his soul. What can a man give in exchange for his soul? The point that Jesus is making is the way you invest your soul is critically important. Examine yourself, and after you've done that, if you've examined your will, then examine your soul. Now, I had to go look again at the original languages to find what is the meaning of soul. If you want to make a note of this, Your soul is simply the seat of your religious and moral sentiments. Let me say that slowly again for those who are taking notes. What is your soul? Your soul is the seat of religious and moral sentiments. In Buddha Afrikaans, it's the stuff you're sentimental about. It says examine yourself, but also then examine your soul. How are you investing your soul? What are the things that your soul is sentimental about? 
Watch out for those things. Because if you're sentimental about religious ideas, you might invest your soul in the wrong way. If you're sentimental about moral ideas, you might invest your soul the wrong way. And here's the problem. You can invest your soul in your sentiments and you can gain so much. You can gain the whole world, but you miss out on His world. The life that God has for you. You tracking with me? So what are the things that you are sentimental about? That's the question Jesus is asking. Some of us are, have got religious sentiments. I had them when I started the journey. I had religious sentiments. I was sentimental about a couple of things my mom and dad told me. Watch out for this. Watch out for that. Watch out for this. Watch out for that. Watch out for those happy clappies. Watch out for those that talk about this big baptism thing. So when I started off, I had a lot of religious sentiments deep inside. Till I encountered the resurrected Lord. Till I realized, oh my goodness, he's alive. Why did my mom and my dad never told me that? And so when I had to deal, when I was confronted with the fact that the Bible speaks about baptisms, plural, there's more than one, there's more than two, there's more than three, there's more than four, there's five I discovered. I was confronted. My religious sentiments was challenged. I had a decision to make. Am I going to invest my soul into the sentiments of my religion and upbringing? Or am I going to invest my soul into the reality of the cross and the death of Jesus where everything changed for me? I had to deal with the religious sentiments of of how people praise the Lord. I remember getting to this English church. They walk in with slip slops. I'm like, oh my goodness, here it is a sector we need to get away. <laughs> and so now you have to understand, I'm a big guy. This church is packed out because the life of God is there. And I'm like, this is awkward. There's not seating space for me with my legs in the second row because it's economy class plus. It's very tight. So they put me right in front of the church, right in front, right in front of the preacher and the pastor, and they're going for it. I'm like, Jesus, swallow me now. <laughs> I'm judging them in my heart thinking, he is there a bunch of palookas. Look at how they're singing. The next morning, the Lord takes me to David where David worshipped the Lord in his jockey underpants. And he get criticized by his wife. I'm like, oh my goodness, Lord, please don't ask me to dance on my jockeys. He says, you're missing the point. You have to deal with your religious sentiments. There's some things you hold on because mom and dad said so, but that's not what the Bible is saying. There's certain, certain hurts that you've held on to. Because the church has caused you pain. You're holding to that sentiment. Oh, I was going to be the same everywhere. My friend, we're at war. The quicker you realize it, the better for you. Let's leave the religious sentiments a little bit. Let's go to the moral sentiments that you invest your soul into. It's amazing how we think in the church, if you are more moral than the brother next to you, then you have got more faith. Can I, can I open up that thought a bit more? <laughs> it's amazing how morality, your sentiment around morality can affect your faith. Because the fact that me and I let, by the grace of God, only had children after we were married, by the grace of God. In most people's eyes, as we, we, we pass the morality test. But the poor folks who, who didn't get that right, who, who managed to get children before they were married, whoo, skanda. Come now. 
You see, you, you investing in morality, you're not investing in the life of God. You're investing in your sentiments. The fact that you don't drink alcohol or battle with alcoholism. Oh no, I, I'm a superior citizen, you know. I look down on those who battle with alcohol. Come now. We all have these moral sentiments and we think that makes us more spiritual. It does not. All it does, it gets you to invest your soul in the sentimental things and you think, oh, I'm gaining the whole world. I've got this pure moral life. Meantime, you're missing the whole game that's being played. You invest in morality. When you come to a stop street and there's a poor beggar next to you, you're like, oh, luckily I'm not like him. You can't even have the dignity just to say morning, sir. What is it? You've got a sentiment around morality. You reckon yourself superior to that poor man. Not realizing that our issue is not morality, our issue is sin. And that everyone has fallen short. And we all need to be saved by a resurrected Savior. Doesn't matter what your past is, doesn't matter what your present is, we all need Jesus. Invest in morality. You come to church with your three-piece suit. You're going to battle to find that one at church, eh? You come in your best jean and your best shirt. And the guy that comes with the slops, it's like, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I, this poor guy's got so much to learn still. I mean, one day he can be like me. You're getting... The essence. We have to in, examine our sentiments, friends. What are we sentimental about? What are the things that we're holding? What are the things that we're trying to hold on instead of saying, oh my goodness, I have to deny those sentiments. I have to consider myself dead, not just to sin, but to the sentiments of my soul that wants to determine and dictate how I live my life. I want to say this, you're in faith when you are not sentimental about anyone or anything. Please write this down. You're in faith when you are not sentimental about anything or about anyone. You're in faith. Mothers, are you sentimental about your children? Or can you trust Jesus to bring them into fullness? Yo. <laughs> Are you sentimental about anything? Let's test that for you. Your favorite Bible. I don't know what you have. Jesus says, give it away. Because that man doesn't have one. It's like, uh, no, 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 no. Well, we just highlighted one of your sentimental areas. Because what is more important? The sentiment of your Bible or obeying Jesus? Give away your car. Oh, no, Lord. You know, I just paid it off. You're sentimental. Do you want to gain the whole world and lose out on his world? Or do you want to invest your soul in his world and lose everything in this world? What are you sentimental about? Some of you are sentimental about your image. <laughs> sentimental about how, what will people think if I go boss? If I dance like Johannes dance on a Sunday morning. Are we okay? And we have to examine, lastly, we have to examine our surrender. Verse 27 of Matthew 16 says this. He says, For the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels, and then He will reward each person according to what He has done. 
I tell the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. I want to show you that whichever way you choose to invest your soul, you're going to get rewarded on one day. To whichever way you're choosing to deny yourself, to accept Christ or deny Christ and bless yourself, either which way, there's going to be a day of reckoning. There's going to be a day in which you are going to get rewarded. And what's going to get tested on that day is not all the things you've done for Jesus. What's going to get tested that day is whether you've surrendered to him completely. Did you allow his life inside of you to dictate how you live? Or was it all about your, your selfish, solely sentimental life? That one day when Jesus comes back, your surrender will be exposed. Your surrender will be revealed and rewarded. Whose life did you surrender to? Your fleshly one or the life of Christ inside of you? I must go slow here. Yeah? Because I've got a challenge of losing you. Let's just, let's just consider the cross for a moment. We've looked at this two or three weekends ago. What happened at the cross? The cross was the place that, that God could make himself fully available to connect with man, to become one with man. In that moment of death on the cross, at the cross, we became one. Happy? In that moment, we died with Jesus to sin. In that moment, we died to self. And because we are dead, because we are dead, now that Jesus has defeated death, now I live with him. Amen? Tracking with me? The story of the cross is the suffering of Jesus. It becomes the meeting place where, where our natures collide. My human nature connects to his divine nature. It becomes a place of union. And because Jesus defeated death, because after three days Jesus did not stay dead, he rose again, I get that same benefit. You get that same benefit. So how did Christ get to live inside of you? Well, it's very simple. You died with him on that cross. You died to sin, you died to self. And in that moment you got united with him. And because Jesus was dead but is no longer, now you live with him. Happy with the theology? So where is this life of God placed? In your body, in your soul, or in your spirit? Where does this life of God, where is this connection? Is it, where did this connection happen? In your body, in your soul, or in your spirit? In your spirit. So is the life inside of you already? Yeah, deeply hidden. The problem is we are so soul orientated that we don't know that our spirits has been reset. Our spirits is connected with God. The life of God is flowing into my spirit. Because Jesus died for sin, he can impart life into my spirit. I've got a decision to make. Am I going to allow my life to be led by the things that comes out of my spirit or by the demands of my soul? Can you hear that challenge? You can have Christ inside of you, but he's so well hidden, no one would know it. You can be born again and have the life of God, the connection of God's spirit with your spirit. You can have that, but you yourself might not know it because you're so investing your soul in the world. So investing your soul in your sentiments. You okay, church? Am I helping us? The cross deals with sin. If you want to be born again, you have to believe that Jesus paid for your sin. Is there anyone here this morning that believes that? Awesome. The rest of you, I'm going to give you a moment. How do you get the life of God? How do you become born again? You have to believe that Jesus died on that cross for you. Happiness? Oh, I'm so grateful that sin is no longer my master. 
Grace now rules over me. So grateful. But do you know there's a difference between being born again and being made mature? Big difference. Most people just happy that they're born again, but there's no marks or signs of maturity on their life. You know why? Because they don't know how to deny themselves. They don't know that when you believe and look at the cross, that you believe that Jesus died for sin. But when you look at the cross, you also have to realize that at the cross, you died to self. And now you have to learn to yield to the life of God that's inside of you already. So how do we become mature? There's a good answer this morning. That's a good question to ask this morning. How do we become mature? What's the difference between a carnal Christian and a spiritual Christian? You want to know? Come back next week. We'll talk about that. (laughs) You're taking notes. Here's the definition of a carnal Christian. A carnal Christian wants to do good, and they're trusting Jesus to help them with their efforts. Think about that. A carnal Christian wants to do good, and they're willing to trust Jesus to help them in their effort, in their pursuit. I mean, who, does, who wants to be a skabanga now that you know the Lord? Anyone? Once you met the Lord, it's like, no, I, want to, I want to get my life transformed. I want to live different. I'm ashamed of the stuff I used to do. I want to live differently. I don't want to stay there. And so it's not wrong to want to have a life that is transformed. But the way you go about it is vitally important. You're still immature in your faith. You're still young in your faith. If you think, I'm going to do good now. Jesus, help me do good. Then I'm really going to bless you. I tell you what, you go for six months. If you really got perseverance, you might get to six years. But eventually you get so tired, you think, oh my goodness, I cannot do this anymore. Anyone? It's because you're still preferring your soul. You haven't learned how to access the life of God that has been given to you already. You're wanting Jesus to come alongside you and bless your effort. Good heart, wrong motive, uh, wrong, wrong method. What does a spiritual Christian look like? You want to take this definition down. You have to get this one. The others you can forget. This one you want to get. A spiritual Christian is someone who considers himself or herself dead. Therefore, if I'm going to live, it's only going to be because I'm trusting him to impart life to me. Because I cannot have it by myself. Do you hear the difference? The question this morning, are you good or are you dead? We're like, what is he talking about? I'm talking about the gospel. I'm talking about the fact that when you were united with Jesus, he died for your sin, but you died with him. You're not alive anymore. And if that is true, then how are you living? There's only one way. You have to come to Jesus every morning, every day, every breath. And so Jesus, impart life to me. I do not have it by myself. I so want to please God, but I don't know how. Would you impart life to me? Because your life is the only way that I can live now. Your will is the only thing I can do now. What you value, I want to value. Deal with the sentiments. Would you impart your life to me? Christ has become my life. Oh my God. I do not want to gain the whole world and never discover this incredible treasure inside of me. You know why you're under tension? It's because you're fighting the life of God inside of you by trying to be good.
That's why we are called believers. You okay, church? What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say, how do you mature? We all start in the honeymoon phase when the, when, when the burden of sin gets lifted off of our lives. We're like, oh, it feels so amazing. I want to do some things for God now. It doesn't take long before all the effort you're trying to do and trying to go and trying to move, it becomes a lot of work. If you get this this morning, friends, your life will liberate. Motive is incredible. I want to I show God I'm so grateful for what He's done, but I'm still trying to do it through my soulish life. Luckily, the Lord is so gracious. He allows us to fail in that system. <laughs> it's not fun when you fail in that system, but the Lord is gracious. Why? Because He wants to show you who's become the source of your life. Do you know that you've got a new source? The source is Jesus Himself, Christ, the Anointed One, placed inside of you. It's His life. It's his life. The more you reckon yourself dead, the more you deny yourself, the easier it is for that life of God just to flow through you, to flow out of you. You access his mind because your mind is dead. So what are you, why are you trying to think with your mind? Just consider yourself dead and say, Lord, I need your mind. I need your thoughts. Thank you. Oh, oh, wow, Lord. You think we can do that? Okay, Lord. All of a sudden, you access his power, not yours. <laughs> Have you tried to, 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 to raise a dead person to life? Have you tried to pull someone out of the wheelchair? How's your power going for you? Your power is not going to be able to do that. But it's when you realize, oh, he's the source. I am dead dead. He's alive. It means not only do I have his mind, I've got access to his power. Oh my goodness, and that power is dynamite. That power now goes through this body. When I lay hands on someone, his power, boom, makes all the difference. You okay, church? Am I helping us? A spiritual Christian is someone who, who knows that they died with Jesus on that cross. Therefore, their only response is to come to Jesus and to receive His life, to receive His perspective, to receive His will, to receive His empowerment, to receive His energy to receive his guidance where does he live inside of you you became united with him where in death the more you reckon yourself dead the more the resurrection life will flow it's just the law of the spirit of life that's in the spirit in Christ we okay So if you're examining yourself this morning, you're in faith when you are looking to him to impart his life. Then you're in faith. I'm curious this morning. Please don't shout it out. I'm curious this morning as you examined your faith, as you tested yourself, is there a 30% mark? Is there a 66% mark or did you pass the test? Can you say this morning, oh my goodness, I'm testing myself. Thank you, I know. I know he lives inside of me. His life is the source now. You okay? Ask the band to come and help us. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus, you've never been born again. 
I'd love to give you an opportunity to respond to Jesus. Friends, it seems like we've got work to do, eh? Seems like we have got to go and fetch some of your neighbors. <laughs> fetch your boss, even your mother-in-law, bring them. They can get born again. Okay? I want to pray this morning for those of us who, after taking the test, have examined yourself and realized, oh my goodness, I'm carnal. My motive is pure. I want to please the Lord, but I'm going around my effort instead of just seeing myself dead, trusting Him to impart life to me. If you recognize this morning, I'm a carnal Christian. I want to be a spiritual one, but I'm a carnal one. Please would you stand? Awesome. While some of you are still deciding, let me tell you a story about where this thing gets real. So I've got a property investment, and in this one particular property, I've got a tenant. Now, I don't know what the Lord is thinking, but I think He's trying to work this thing into my life as I'm preaching it this morning with this particular tenant. So I'm a pastor, you know, so you have to love on people. That's what the Bible says. So I see this lady and I'm reckoning, oh my goodness, this thing is going to, oh, let me just try and love on her. Let me try and help her. So Brachis, every month, either there's no payment or the payment is late. Now, you must understand, this lady is starting to mess with my family's livelihood. So am I justified to want to muscle a little bit? Anyone? When you touch my wife, you will look for your teeth. You touch my children, you might look for your head as well. And so on the inside of me, everything inside of me wants to get this girl, and I want to I wanna smack her, man. So I put a little deadline out. I said, listen, please, by this time, at least just communicate with me. Never mind paying me, just communicate with me, which doesn't happen as well. So now everything inside of me is go. Go, go, sort it out. I'm writing the WhatsApp, and as I'm writing it, the Lord says, what are you busy doing now? I'm like, Lord, what do you mean? She's clearly in the wrong. She's affecting my family. Surely I need to do something now. He says, okay, let's see how far this thing goes. Now, you know when God asks you those questions, you know. So I'm like, oh. My daughter looks at me, she says, Dad, what's wrong with you? I said, no, nothing is wrong. I'm just weighing through some things. So I write the WhatsApp, the next one. I said, listen, girl, the way we're pursuing things is not going to end well for you and for me. Just bless you. Just get out of the house, but this time, just bless you. Now, I still don't have the backs, but I have the freedom. Why? Because the life of God inside of me was speaking to my conscience saying, you cannot do that. That's not what Jesus would have done. Are we okay? Is anyone here this morning saying, man, I'm a carnal Christian. I want to do good. I want Jesus to help me. But I've never considered myself dead. Please, would you stand real quick? Awesome. Awesome. Do you mind to close your eyes with me? Father, this morning as we come, we examine our faith. It's a challenging conversation to have with you, Father. Because it's not even so much a sin issue as it is a selfish issue. Our motive is that we want to please you. But the problem is, is that we still think that we are the source that has to work those things out. Therefore, this morning, I 
I come on behalf of myself and these brothers and sisters that's standing before us. And we choose to repent. We choose to repent. Jesus, we are so grateful that you saved us. And in our zeal, we try to, with our effort, trying to impress you, try to serve you. Instead of realizing that we died with you, we've got nothing to offer. So we come this morning. We come this morning and we choose to invest our souls in the death of Jesus. We've died with him. We don't have a say anymore. We don't have a will anymore. We don't have <laughs> self is still real, but we've died even to self. As you're standing before him this morning, don't you want to simply just pray this prayer of repentance? Just repent of the of the mindset. That you think it is with your effort that he will bless, that you will come ahead. Just repent. Your motive is so pure. You want to please the Lord, but your method is wrong. The only way we please the Lord, the only way is we allow the life of Christ inside of us to start to, to become the focus. And we bless you this morning bless you this morning we talk about this truth we speak about the repentance of dead works it's effort friends if you're tired of the effort this morning repent just give the effort to Jesus consider yourself see yourself dying with him on that cross not just to sin but also to self I'm Holy Spirit you're the teacher. You're the teacher. Jesus said that it's better for him to go and for you to come because with you, through your teaching, you teach us spirits one-on-one. -on -one. Come help us, Holy Spirit. Ah, oh, Jesus. Would you mind if we all stood friends? morning we have an opportunity to follow Jesus' example I know the mandate on the basis, a big mandate is to serve nations is to plant churches, is to get people born again, is to gather the great reward for Jesus it's a great mandate but the only way we're going to get that right is by learning how to yield to His Spirit learning how to yield to death. My opinions don't matter anymore. My preferences is dead. The only way I can live is when I have moments like this and ask Jesus to impart his life afresh. Would you do that with me? Would you mind to just raise your hands as you are comfortable? Just receive. Just ask Jesus to impart. His resurrection life. Lord, I speak in activation this morning of the spirits of these men and women for their spirits to be activated in faith. I thank you for the divine connection, the divine nature, the connection of your nature with our spirits. You're living inside of us. You're thinking inside of us. You're moving inside of us. You are working inside of us this morning. Holy Spirit, would you come and help us locate the life of Christ inside of us? Thank you that sin is no longer relevant because we've died to it. <laughs> we bless you. We bless you, Lord. I thank you that condemnation is falling off of people this morning. 
Because the law of the spirit of life says before we can enjoy life, we have to enjoy death. Thank you this morning that we can remind ourselves, Lord. We died with you and now we receive your life. Just more. If you're comfortable to pray in tongues, do that. If you're comfortable just to praise Jesus in your mother tongue, praise him. He's become your life. He's living inside of you. He's moving inside of you. He's working inside of you. Oh, we bless you this morning, Lord. Bless you this morning, Lord.